Tonight, for a few moments, I want to take you to an old-fashioned potter's house. I couldn't go to Israel and find what I wanted. Couldn't go there anyway because it was too far and I couldn't swim. But uh, uh, the nearest thing I could find to the type of potter's house that was in the Bible was in Mexico. So I went to Saltillo, old Mexico, and there, four or five miles out of town, was the potter's house. I didn't realize at that time what all was involved, but I have since. And tonight I want to take you to the potter's house, but I want you to turn first of all in your Bibles to the New Testament, two portions of Scripture, one in the New and one in the Old. But in the New Testament, Romans chapter 9, and I want you to stand as we read verses 20 through verse 24. What's the first two words? Nay, but. Nay, but. Okay. Let's read it together. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Father, bless thy holy word. Bless it to our hearts and our lives. By thy spirit, speak to our hearts, lead in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I want you to think for just a moment here. In verse 20, where he says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? There's two questions in that verse. And the first one is, replying against God. And the second one, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Now, folks, those two questions, I dare say every one of us, at some time or another, in some form or fashion, have really proposed those same two questions. And the first one is, uh, you've questioned God about what he's doing in your life. You replied against God. You questioned God. You, you wouldn't have done it that way. God, you, wouldn't, you would have chosen another path, another way, other circumstances. But God, we question God replying against him. And then he says in the next part of that verse, shall the thing formed. Now man is a thing formed. And God is the one who formed us. And he says, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? It took me a long time uh, to realize that I, I hated, I resented being oversized. Now, I'm not fat. I'm just big for my age. <laughs> but I've been, I've been large all my life. I weigh within five pounds of what I did when I was 16 years old. I've never, I've always resented it, but I've always tried to be an overachiever to account for it. In the military, I tried to go further and faster than anybody else and be, at least have the endurance. And so the thing about it is that I, I begin to question God. Why did you form me like this? Why did you make me like this? This is the way God warned me to be. Not because it's not the outward man, it's the inward man. That needs to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, we are to discipline our lives and we're to live the right kind of lives and so forth, and that's true. But the thing is, we question God, why has he made it this, why are these things happening in our life? And we begin to question God. And then he says in the next verse, hath not the potter power over the clay? Now who's your potter? God is the potter. And who's the clay? We are. Isaiah put it this way, he said, thou art the potter, we are the clay, and we are the work of thine hands. God wants to work in our lives. 
He wants to take and mold and shape this clay into a vessel that is meet for the master's use. One that will properly uh, do and serve in the way. And he says here, make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. In a house with many vessels, there will be some vessels that are for show and for company and for special occasions. Maybe you have a set of dishes that are set aside just for uh, a special occasion. And only when you have company do you use them. Otherwise, you use paper plates. <laughs> right? Okay. And, uh, and so God has vessels under honor that are places to be uh, seen and emphasized. Then he has vessels unto dishonor. There are some vessels in the house that are not public. They're not, uh, um, you have some pots and pans that you use, and maybe you use them daily. But they're not really for display. They're just for use. And, uh, and, and I say just for use, but nobody could take their place, and I'll mention that later. And it says here in verse 22, What if God willing to show His wrath and make known His power endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that He might do what? Make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He hath before or afore prepared unto glory. Even us. Now think about this. Whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now folks, my dad used to say I was a more Jew than I was Baptist. Now I'm not Jewish by ancestry, just in nature. But never, well, my dad was just a good old Scotch Irishman or something like that. I don't know what all. But anyway, the thing about it is that uh, uh, he thought I was tighter than I ought to be and tried to squeeze a penny harder than it should be and so forth. But the thing is that the gospel, the work of the Lord is with us, not just the Jew, but us Gentiles also. Now turn with me, if you will, please, to the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 18. And while you're turning there to Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1, I want you to be aware of the fact that, that we're going down to the potter's house. Well, 1,600 years ago, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. God bid him to get up and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my word. Now I want you to notice, and he, when he got down there, he not only heard the word of God, but he saw the word of God in action. He learned, had an object lesson, and God was teaching him that we too might learn. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work, on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. When Isaiah said, we are the clay, thou art the potter, and we're all the work of thine hands, I want you to be aware of two things tonight. Number one, that you and I, man in the, in the beginning was made out of the dust of the ground, and dust is nothing in the world but moist, uh, uh, clay is nothing in the world but moist uh, dust, and, uh, and made out of the dust of the ground, and God breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, folks, man did not create God. God created man. And when you stop to think about it here, he's talking about going down to the potter's house and working with the clay. And I want you, as you watch this potter, and keep in mind the potter is God, a type and picture of God, and the clay is a type and picture of you and me. And the potter wants to work in the heart and the life of the clay. And he wants to mold it and shape it and conform it to his own image or to the image he wants it to be. 
So tonight when you see the potter touching the clay, it gives us a lesson of what our potter wants to do in our lives as the clay. And so I want you to go with me to an old-fashioned potter's house. Now, I, I went down to the potter's house, and uh, I had some friends with me. I had about three or four other people with me. had a young boy, 16. I'll tell you about him later. But nevertheless, we went down there, and, and we saw what you're going to see tonight. I want to take you for a few moments to the old-fashioned potter's house. But before we go, now, I want to share one thing with you. Who was Jeremiah that wrote about that God said, Go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words? Who was Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah was the evangelist of his day. He was the prophet. But there was something unusual about Jeremiah. He had a long ministry, 60-year ministry. Now, if, if you know your Bible, you know that Jeremiah was often called the weeping prophet. Now, he didn't weep because he was weak. He wept, and he was a weeping prophet because he was burdened, he was broken for the sins of God's people. He knew a truth that God's people couldn't sin against God and get by with it without recompense. That God would deal with us and judge us if we, if we sin against God. If we turn our back upon God, if we walk away from God, if we leave God out of our life, we're the loser, not God. And so Jeremiah wept because God's people were bent on not serving God and living for God. And these were desperate days. And Jeremiah was one of the few remaining prophets. There were two other prophets. One of them was Daniel. And the other was Ezekiel. Now Ezekiel was to the people that were in, uh, in the land of Babylon on, by, the rank, uh, by the river. And uh, he ministered to the people that were in bondage. And Daniel ministered to the palace under Nebuchadnezzar and those that followed him. You see, but only Jeremiah remained in the land of Palestine, in the land of Israel. And he was ministered to those people. And those people turned a deaf ear to Jeremiah. In fact, later on in this book of Jeremiah, it gives us a scene of the times. Jeremiah wrote the Word of God, and the king, was, it was read in the king's presence. And the king so resented the Word of God and hated the Word of God and rejected the Word of God that he took his penknife and slashed it to pieces and threw it into the open fire fireplace that it might be burned and destroyed. That was his contempt toward not only Jeremiah, the prophet of God, the spokesman of God, but it was also his contempt for the Word of God. And the next verse is even more frightening. There was no fear of God before his face or before his eyes. They were not afraid of God to mutilate the Word of God. But we're living in those same kind of times today. People will mutilate the Word of God. They'll violate God's day. They'll violate God's Word. They'll got, violate God's house and God's name with no fear of God before their eyes. They're not afraid. They don't stand. They're, they're, they're blind. They don't see what they're doing. We're living in those kind of days. We're living in the last days. And Jeremiah was warning them, and he was telling them that, that Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian army, was on its way, and it was coming, and it was drawing nearer and nearer and nearer, that God was going to judge his people, and they didn't, they didn't see it. They didn't want to hear that message. That wasn't what they wanted to hear. And so, therefore, they rejected the ministry of Jeremiah. Now, folks, that's a heartbreak, because the people you love... Turn their back upon God, there is no hope for them. God's our only hope. God's our only hope today in America. All of our plans and all of our laws and all of our uh, new fangled ways and things and everything, they're not, uh, new technology is not the answer, but an old fashioned revival of turning back to God is. And that's what each individual needs, that's what you need, that's what I need. And Jeremiah was calling the people to repentance, and they hated him for it. So God told him to go down to, Jer uh, down to the potter's house, and there he would cause him to hear the word that he would speak to him. And when he got down there, he didn't just hear the word of God. He saw the word of God. He saw the potter take the clay and mold it and shape it and make it what he wanted it to be. I want you to go with me to the potter's house. I'm going back here and sit by my friend Tim. 
I'll have to straighten him out. He's done a fantastic job, and I appreciate you, Tim. But tonight I'm going to sit with you and ask for the lights, if you please, to be turned out. If you've ever been to old Mexico, you're familiar with the, uh, the houses and, and the buildings and so forth. And here's an adobe building with an adobe wall around the yard and a pile of clay, uh, fresh dug from the pit, and brought here to the potter's house and piled up outside. The only value to this pile of clay is the time and effort that it took to dig it out of the ground and bring it here to the potter's house. Now, this is a pile of the clay. Now, you notice in the, in the center a nice sharp rock, or not rock, but a lump of clay. Now, that, uh, I'm going to let that represent your pastor, since he's nice, sharp looking. You look at some of the other clumps of clay there, and maybe you see one there that could represent you tonight. I see one that looks like John waving his arms. And I see another one there like the piano player, and one like the organist. And, and maybe you can find one that represents you. But over on the extreme left, there's a large lump there, barely in the picture. And since I'm a large person, I've always thought that represented me. And you see, the potter takes a piece of that clay, and breaks it open to discern if it's the kind of clay that he's willing to work with. And seeing that it is, he takes and a hammer and begins to pound, to beat, to pulverize until he breaks it up into small pieces. And then he takes it after he's broken it up. And uh, by the way, the Word of God is like a hammer that breaks it to pieces. And that's what he does. He pulverizes it. And then he takes it, picks it up in a bucket and carries it over to a vat of water. All through the Bible, water is a type of the Word of God. And here he takes that dry, lifeless clay and submerges it in the water. And then as it dissolves, he pours more water in until it's totally dissolved. And when it's totally dissolved, he dips it out and carries it over and pours it into this shallow trough and cuts it up into uh, squares. And then as he needs to, he comes and gets one of those squares and carries it into the corner of the potter's house and puts it there under a canvas. Now he comes and gets this piece of clay, and he carries it over to an old-fashioned flat stone. It's a kneading stone, kind of like mom's old-fashioned kneading board, where she'd take her dough and roll it and twist it and turn it and knead it and, and work with it until she had it the right consistency uh, to make those biscuits or a pie crust or whatever she wanted to make. Well, he does much the same with the clay. He folds it, and he picks it up, slams it down. He's bringing it into a uniformity and a consistency where it will uh, do what he wants it to do and respond to his touch when he puts it on the wheel. And then he rolls it up and then he takes and forms it into a lump and sets it on the edge of the table, awaiting the time that he'll put it on the wheel. Now you notice the potter here, he's sitting there at the wheel. He dipped his right hand into a bucket of water. Uh, water is a type of what? The Word of God. And our potter, as he touches our lives, it's through the moisture of the Word. And he touches that clay. When his hands, if they're dry, the clay will not receive it, and, and uh, he can't get the clay to react like it ought to. But it's through the Word, or the water, uh, upon his hands that he touches the clay and begins to form and shape it and make it into the vessel that he wants it to be. And then you notice the two wheels. And Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, and the potter wrought a work upon the wheels. Now, the two wheels, there's a large kick wheel down below, about three and a half feet across, weighs about 40 pounds, 30, 40 pounds. And then there's a uh, shaft going up through the bottom of the table uh, to a small wheel on top of the table where he works with the clay. The, the uh, wheel down below, he pushes it forward faster and faster and faster with his right foot. And his left foot sat there doing nothing almost all day. And uh, I, I smiled and I said, doesn't that right leg get tired and weary doing all that work? And he grinned. He said, no, the right leg just gets stronger by doing the work. It's the left leg that does nothing that sits here idle and gets weary. And you know, I found that to be true in the average Baptist church. Those who are sitting out on the sidelines idle are the ones that grumble and gripe and complain and carry on about what's not being done while the others that are uh, growing and, and doing the work are the ones that grow stronger. And then he began to push the wheel forward with the ball of his right foot faster and faster and faster, used his left foot, or pardon me, used his, le uh, his uh, right heel uh, to uh, use it as a brake to slow it down or to stop it or to speed it up. Uh, and so all day long he was working that uh, wheel down below that it might spin up above 
with the clay there on top of the table. Now, as he works with the clay, his hands are constantly moist with the water of the Word. And he begins to pull the clay up, and as he works with the clay, the clay has a natural tendency to get dry. And when it gets dry, it gets, it gets stiff. And when it gets stiff, it gets stubborn. And when it gets stubborn, it won't respond and yield to the touch of the potter. So the potter continually adds water to it. And as the clay receives the water, the water of the Word, even as you and I, as we receive the water of the Word, then we soften and, and we respond to the touch of the potter in our life. And then he begins to form into shape and make another vessel. Here he's got his left hand on the inside of the uh, vessel with his right hand on the outside of the vessel uh, exercising corresponding pressure. Now, I'm not skilled at this. And if I were to try to do this, uh, I would probably put too much pressure on the outside, he'd cave in. Or if I put too much pressure on the inside, it'd balloon out. But either way, I'd probably make a mess of it. But the potter knew exactly what pressures to bring internally and externally, inside and outside, spiritually and physically in our lives that we might be conformed to the image He wants us to be. And then He begins to uh, finish it up and, and finishes up the lip of the vessel and then He cuts it loose from the lump and sets it aside. Now, He was going to make and show me how that He could make and He made five different lids. I only took one picture. I didn't think it necessary to take all five of them, but I wish I had them now. But anyway, he made uh, five different lids, and every lid was designed somewhat different than the others. But you know, every lid fit perfectly that one vessel, that one sugar bowl that he made. And I was so amazed, without any measurements, without any, uh, nothing but his skill with his eyes, the, train, the training that he had, the skill that he had, he was able to make those vessels, all uh, those uh, tops to fit that same vessel. To me, it was just a commentary on Romans 8, 28, for you know how that all things work together for good to them that love Him, to them who are called according to His purpose. Our potter knows how to make all things work together for His glory and for our good. And then He begins to form and shape other vessels uh, much the same way. Pressure on the outside, pressure on the inside, and different sizes, different stages, different steps, but He, he makes the vessel. Then he, when He gets it finished, to his satisfaction, he cuts it loose from the lump and sets it aside. Now he pulls up clay from the top of the lump to make another vessel. He's going to make a Mexican sombrero. It took him less than 10 seconds to make one of these. And so my flash wouldn't rejuvenate that fast, and I had him to make several of them so I could get it at different steps and stages. But he could make whatever he wanted to make. It just up to him what he made. In other words, he never once did I hear him ask the clay, Clay, what would thou have me to make you? And never once did I hear the clay say, Why hast thou made me thus? You know, it's not up to us. In reality, it's up to our potter. And here he formed and shaped it and made, increased it and set it aside. And he made others. He could make them all alike or he could make them uh, all different. In other words, he was, he was the master. He was in control. And the clay simply responded and yielded to his touch. And whatever the master or the potter chose, that was what the clay was willing to be. Now, I asked him, what tools do you use? And I was surprised when he laid these five simple tools out on the edge of the workbench. All five of these tools wouldn't cost you a nickel in that area. In the extreme left is a half piece of bamboo. And then a piece of rubber, about eight inches long, an inch and a quarter wide. A piece of string, about 16 inches long. It's doubled here. Makes it look like about seven or eight inches tied to a rusty nail so he can find it when he needs it. And then a broken vessel. And you know it pleased the potter to reach down to the trash pile and pick up a broken vessel to use it to form and shape and finish other vessels that could go on and be used for his glory. And then on the extreme right is a piece of tin about an inch wide and bent at opposite right angles on each end. You see all five of these tools could be found almost anywhere uh, in that area. And there wasn't a nickel's worth of value. The value is not in the tool, but in him who uses the tool. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he said, For you uh, see your calling, brethren, how not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things which are wise. And God has chosen the base things and the things which are despised and the things which are naught 
that no flesh should glory in His presence. You see, God is the one who uses the tool. It's not the value of the tool. It's the value of Him who uses the tool and His skill and His ability. And here He forms and takes a half piece of bamboo with it. He finishes up the outside of the vessel. And then with the uh, strip of rubber, He finishes up the lip of a bowl. With the string, He cuts the vessel loose from the lump and sets it aside. Now here's five or six coffee cups on the extreme left. They're, they've been formed and shaped, but they're not finished. They're not ready to be used yet. They've just been formed and shaped. They're still very soft and very pliable. And if I tried to pick up one of those without the skill of the potter, uh, it would leave, I would leave my fingerprint impressions. In other words, it takes a special skill to pick them up when they're this soft and this pliable. These are very formal. And then you look at that little saucer there in the foreground, the sugar bowl behind it, and then the cream pitcher. And look at that little scallop dish. Now, when he, I watched him, he made all these out of the same lump. And I looked, at, I looked at him, and I thought, well, that little scallop dish. And when he made it, he formed it and shaped it and cut it loose from the lump. And then he held it in his hand like I'd seen my mother do a pie crust and crimped it around and did it so effortlessly. I mean, it just seemed like it, it was just a, a second nature with him. He just made it, and it was so pretty, and he set it aside. And I thought, well, how pretty that was. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to ask him if I can have that little scallop dish. And then I began to think. If that scallop dish could talk, it might say something to the little plain saucer next to it. I'm prettier than you are. The Bible warns us against such foolish pride that we think more highly of ourselves than we ought, deceiving our own selves. Because you see, all these vessels are made out of the same clay by the same potter, one after the other. And if there's any beauty, any, uh, anything to be praised in any of them, it's not because of the kind of clay it is, it's because of the work of the potter. And let a little hard piece of clay to the right of that little scallop dish be a witness to each of us. Remember the pit from which you were dug and the rock from which you were hewn. We are all the same. Paul, Apostle Paul put it this way, I am what I am by the grace of God. And then while we were there, someone reached across and picked up that little scallop dish, squashed it, destroyed it, marred it, my heart rebelled. I thought I loved it. I liked it. I, saw, I liked what I saw. I planned to take it home with me. And all of a sudden now it's marred. And he took it. And as he put it back on the lump, back on the wheel, he made it yet again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Let me share with you a truth here. You see, once the clay is hardened, it, really, it may be repaired, but it'll never be the same. And most of the time, once it's broken or cracked, it's thrown away. It's a castaway. But as long as the clay is soft and pliable and yielded the potter, he can put it back on the lump, put it back on the wheel, and he can yet make of it another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. And personally, I like what he did the second time even better than what he did the first time. And then he cuts it loose from the lump and sets it aside. Now, I looked over in the dark corner, and there was these... Oh, it was a dark corner. I had to use my flash to get the picture. And here I noticed stack after stack, row after row of bows, and most of them were much the same. And I noticed that some of them had dark circles in the bottom of those bows. And I asked, what's wrong with these over here? And they answered and said, there's nothing wrong with them. They're going through a special part of their uh, uh, preparation. They're going through a drying, a seizing, a curing process. They're going through, uh, uh, they'll sit here for weeks and uh, until they're completely, totally dry, and all that moisture, those dark circles in the bottom is moisture still in the clay. And if these were to be put into the fiery furnace before they're totally dry, they would uh, crack and be wasted and be marred and would never be used. And so they're going through a very vital step and stage. You know, I've had a lot of preacher boys and missionaries and so forth that I've worked with through the years, and you know, almost every one of them, when they first surrender to preach, they're chomping at the bits. They want to get out there and, and, and start preaching and start pastoring or start uh, go to the mission field without preparation. I tell them to get behind their pastor, dog his tracks, and learn to win souls and get your roots down deep in the Word of God and get some preparation. And, you know, most of them are wanting to chomp at the bits and go right now uh, to the mission field. And that's great. I, I value that. I appreciate that. But in reality, they need to prepare themselves for the work of the Lord.
And this preparation here is very vital to their survival. And then there are other vessels, if you please, some on the shelves, some in the corner, some on the floor, and some outside. And they're all going through the same waiting process. Most of us are very impatient, and we want to see something happen right now, even if it's not right or good. And then when they're totally dry, they're taken and put into the kiln, into the fiery furnace. Now this furnace here, uh, I took a picture of it, and, uh, and uh, it was... Uh, the compartments there and it, uh, those uh, chips there were dividers that separated vessel from de vessel. And uh, then the fire was built, something like 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, and a miracle seemed to take place for that, which is no dirty telltale gray, now becomes almost a, a spotless white in most instances. And But alas, there was tragedy, a casualty. And I didn't understand at first why this one didn't uh, survive when all the others seemed to survive. And then it, I became aware of the fact that it wasn't ready for the fiery furnace and it couldn't survive. It, and the heat and the uh, temptation overcame it and overwhelmed it and destroyed it. Now the potter's brother comes and takes them out of the furnace and he begins to examine them and uh, puts a design up on them and, and check them out and make sure they're uh, proper and fit and then he'll paint design upon them. Now I've been told that I'm colorblind. Now, I'm really not colorblind, but I've been told I was. Now that happened, well, by the way, uh, I, I'm color ignorant. I believe I'd rather be colorblind. But anyway, what color is that right there? That happens to be a, a dark, pardon me, a, a, a dull, drab, dry orange. Now it doesn't look that way right there to you, but what it is, it's a, it's a deep, dark, beautiful, luxurious brown. Oh, you say, well, something's wrong with your slide. No, no. You see, things aren't always as they seem right now because this is the color it is, and it's painted on that vessel, and when that vessel is put back into the furnace a second time, then there's a transformation that takes place, and that which is no dull, drab, dry orange becomes a deep, uh, luxurious brown. See, things are not always as they seem. Here, some time ago, I have a, had a precious lady, 83 years of old, Mother Porter. She was 30, uh, 83 years old, and, and, uh, and she lived down not too far from the church. And I'd go by, I'd see her out on the porch, and one day I stopped by and got out of the car, walked up on the porch, and sat down in the rocking chair there by her. She had a couple of them there. And we began to talk, and she was telling me about, uh, uh, started telling me about the burden of her heart. She said, my son in, in uh, Odessa, Texas, he's up in the 60s right now, and, and he's not saved, preacher, and I know I'm coming to the end of my life. And who's going to pray for my son? Who's going to bear my son before the Lord when I'm gone? I mean, pre preacher, I'm burdened for my son that's not saved. And after she poured out her heart to me for about 15 minutes, and she quieted down just a little bit, I said, Mother Porter, what is that you're working on? She said, I'm embroidering a scarf. Almost through with it. And I said, may I see it? So she handed it to me and I turned it upside down, looked at the bottom of it. I said, Mother Porter, this is the biggest mess I've ever seen in my life. And she reached out quickly and turned it right side up and said, Pastor, you're looking at the wrong side of it. I said, yes, Mother Porter, and you and I right now are looking at the wrong side of eternity. As much as you love your lost son, God loves him more. And I know one thing. You've been faithful to the Lord, and you love the Lord, and you've prayed for your son. And God's going to honor that prayer. I don't know when and I don't know how. But I'll guarantee you, God will not let that prayer go unheeded. You trust God in that. Well, she died a few years, a couple of years later. Of course, her family was there, her son was there, and so forth. And I witnessed to him. I told him about his mother's burden. He said, oh, I've known that for years. Well, about six or seven years ago, he walked into the services one Mother's Day. Come all the way from Odessa, which is about 350 miles. He came to Bowie just to be there to honor his mother. And he said, Pastor, I want to tell you something before the service. So we stepped aside. He said, Preacher, I trusted the Lord last year as my Savior. 
and I've been out on soul winning and visiting, and I've been serving and working, and I've never been happy in my life. And I just wonder if my mother knows it. I said, you hear that shouting all over glory? Sure she knows it. You know, the th strange part of it is we don't see things as they are right now. Right now it looks like a dull drab orange, but later it'll be transformed into an object of beauty. Then other vessels, and they're being prepared and made and, and designed, put upon them and so forth, even the cup. A cup is the most mentioned vessel in the Bible. And I mentioned this morning how the, the cup, my cup, runneth over. You know when Mr. Cup overflows, Mr. Saucer gets a blessing. And the only thing we have to share with our neighbors, friends, and loved ones is the overflow in our life. And then other vessels, these are not ready to be used. They're formed, they're shaped, there's been some design and effort put on them. But you notice that they're, they're still not waterproof. If you poured water in these, it would seep out. It wouldn't run out. It would just seep out because they're, they're not waterproof at this point. They need to be glazed. And then other vessels. They're, uh, they're painted, decorated, and, and they've come a long way, but they're still going through a drying process. Each step requires some waiting and some patience. And then uh, some on the shelves some other vessels, and then the son of the potter comes and gets them one by one and totally submerges them in this orange solution, which I call the glory solution. You see, when you dip them into this, and they're submerged completely inside and outside, covered with this orange solution, whatever beauty was there now is not there. You don't see it. And so uh, it's it's covered over, it's dull, drab, dry, orange. But you know when this is put back in the kiln, this becomes a transparent glaze revealing all the workmanship of the potter and the design and all of the mechanism. And then other uh, vessels on the shelf, some waiting to dry, some waiting for different steps and stages and put back into the furnace a second time and a lesser fire is made and like 21, 2200 degrees Fahrenheit and then the, trans, uh, the dry, draw dry, dry, dry orange becomes a transparent glaze. Here's the finished cup on the left, and then the cup in the middle that's got the uh, glory solution, and then the cup on the right that's been designed. Uh, the potter comes and gets them and takes them out of the fiery furnace and, uh, and examines them and makes them, prepares them ready for market. I asked if there was a home nearby that I could go in and take a few pictures. And they graciously invited me into this home. And this woman was extremely proud of her kitchen. You see on the uh, table there, there was a tablecloth, oil cloth, and that was rather rare. And then there was a couple of cups and a plate and a matching bowl with a cover. And, uh, and she was proud of her kitchen because her husband worked there at the potter's house and they probably had more vessels than anybody else. And here's her kitchen. Now, she was proud of it. And you notice down in the lower right-hand corner, that large white speckled pot with the black cover? That's her hot and cold running water. The kids run to the well to get that cold water, and, uh, and uh, they run to the well and get that cold water, hot and cold running water. Okay, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> and then if you notice on the extreme upper right-hand, uh, left-hand corner, you notice a large basket hanging there, and underneath it, there's a large vessel there, and I asked the family, I said, what vessel here is the most important vessel, the one that's appreciated, the one that would be missed the most if it was broken or gone or something happened to it? Well, Daddy looked at Mama, and the Mama looked at the kids, and, and, uh, and uh, soon she turned and went over and picked up this old large orange pot, brought it over and handed it to me, and I took it and looked at it, turned it every which way, and it didn't look like much to me. And I said, what is it? And they said, it's a bean pot. It would hold about two gallons of, of water and, and beans and so forth. And uh, you notice the streaks at the bottom tells that it goes through the fire daily. The streaks up the side, the chip out of the edge. It's not perfect. And I looked at it and I said, well, wouldn't a new one be better? And she said, oh, no, this one has just the right flavor that my family enjoy. This one is seasoned. 
and another one could it'd take a long time for it to ever be appreciated as much as this one is. And we use this every day. She every morning she'd get up and stoke a place on fire and fill it full of water and beans and seasoning and so forth and let it sit there and cook and simmer all day long, preparing food for her precious family. Now, compared to a coffee cup, and by the way, that coffee cup is about twice the size of most of our coffee cups. So you can see in relation to the bean pot, it's rather small. But think about it for a moment, folks. The potter designed each vessel to do something special. The cup was meant to drink out of and to serve coffee or whatever drink you might have. The bean pot was meant to meet the need of a larger part of the family. And you could drink coffee out of the bean pot, but just think of how cold it'd be before you got to the bottom. And you could probably eat, cook beans in the, in the cup, but it wouldn't be practical. You couldn't cook, cook enough for one, much less for a family. You see, the potter had his own design in each vessel that he made. And he, that's where he will bless that vessel as it meets his use. And then other vessels, the vessel, the pitchers, the very colored pitchers with uh, design and so forth, and then other vessels, the pitcher and the vase, the very colored vase and pitcher, and then the cup. And uh, these were vessels of honor, if you please, in the house. And when company came, why, and Mama knew about it ahead of time, when she'd send the kids out in the field and gather some flowers, bring them, put them in that vase, and set that vase in the center of the table, in the center of the room. People come in and just ooh and ah and brag about how pretty the flowers are, the vase is, and everything. But you know, I never wanted my ministry to be seen and heard for that purpose. I want it to be like that old bean pot that's just barely in the picture on the right-hand side. I want my ministry, and I, I've prayed that th every time I see this picture, that my ministry would be like that old bean pot, that every time it goes through the fire, every time it's used daily, that it will minister and meet the need and satisfy the hunger of those that it serves. And then as I left the house and went back into the potter's yard, I noticed that uh, I was walking along looking at my camera to see how many more pictures I might have on that roll of film. And all of a sudden, somebody cried out and said, Preacher, look out! And I stopped. And I almost stepped into this trash pile of broken pieces of pottery. And I started to walk around it. And I believe the Holy Spirit of God arrested me. Because I turned around and I looked at those broken pieces of pottery and my heart began to weep. Because, you know, I can tell you the names of those that I see as castaways. I've known men that surrendered to preach. That have, volunt that have said God called them to m be missionaries, to, su to serve in s Sunday school and, and uh, ministry and the music and whatever phase it is. And I've seen them get cold and bitter and let things come into their life. Maybe bitterness or jealousy or pride or maybe something else came in, the lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. I've let See, they got offended some way or another, or maybe they just got drawn away. And the first thing you know, they're out of church and away from God, and their lives are wasted testimony. Now, look, folks, I'm not talking about a, a, a broken pile of trash of, of a lost soul. This is, a, this is those castaway. Paul said the one thing he feared above everything else is, lest after having preached the gospel to others, that he himself should become a castaway. In other words, after having preached the gospel, and then he himself be a failure in the ministry as a witness of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, it's not just a trash pile and a wasted life for an unsaved person. It's a burning hell. It's forever separation. And tonight I see a picture here of, of those lives, and I could name you the, give you the names of many of them that started out and ran well for a while, and then fell aside. Oh, it breaks your heart. And every time I see this picture, I, I weep. Because the last thing I want is my ministry to be a castaway. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul knew that. I know that. 
I trust you know that. You see, I'm not worried about losing my soul salvation, but I am worried about losing my testimony and my opportunity to serve the Lord my God. Maybe some of you seen that broken pile of trash. Maybe you're not there yet, but if you continue the way you are, it could be just a little while and you too would be a castaway. God forbid. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your heart tonight and turn you back to Him. Then we left there and went back into the potter's house. And he had these two vessels made by the same potter out of the same lump, one after the other. One went on to completion, the other was a castaway, a failure. I don't think I need to ask you tonight which one you'd rather be. I think if you're wise, you'd say, I don't want to be that broken vessel, that failure, that castaway, the one the master can't use. I want to be the vessel that's meet for the master's use. You know, today, God's not looking for finished vessels. You know what God's really looking for? God's looking for soft, yielded, pliable clay that will he can put on the wheel and mold and shape and make a vessel under honor, a vessel meet for the master's use. He's looking for clay tonight that will yield to his touch and respond to his will. God wants you and me. He's not looking for finished vessels or perfection. He's looking for soft clay that say, Lord, thou, I am the clay. Thou art the potter. And we are all the work of thine hands. While we were there at the potter's house, we had the friends I spoke of a moment ago. We had a 16-year-old boy. He was a precious boy, but, you know, he was full of questions. And he asked a thousand questions, it seemed like, one after another. Anytime he was trying to do something or talk or say something, He'd, he'd interrupt with a question. <coughs> Finally, after a while, he said, Preacher, can I ask one more question? One more question? I said, yes, sir, what is it? I was kind of thankful when he said one more. <laughs> I said, what is it? He said, is that all that grown man has to do is sit there and play with mud all day long? I thought, what a stupid, then like a bolt of lightning, the truth, that thing came home to my heart. Because see, to me, the potter was a type of my God. Is that all God has to work with is to play with mud all day long? God can work with whatever he wants to work with. He could work with the cherubim, with the seraphim, with the archangels, with the angels. He could work with the great minerals of this world. He could work with all the great metals, the great uh, uh, gold, silver, platinum. I mean, he could work with anything he chooses to work with. But I'm so thankful tonight that he's willing to work with clay with mud like you and me. And he's willing to touch our lives for his glory and for our good. When we were in seminary preparing for the ministry back in 1950, 51, 52, my wife and I were the dorm parents at the, at the dormitory, the married couple's dormitory. It was three stories tall, had 27 families. And it was all one-room efficiency apartments. And we lived in the, in the central, on the ground floor. And uh, we were the dorm parents. No pay, but a lot of privileges. Had, it had its perks, I mean, you know, benefits. But the main benefit was that we got into the lives of all these other students. When they hurt, we hurt. When they rejoiced, we rejoiced. When one of them had a sadness or a sickness, when one of them was out of work or something like that, we could share, and we got involved with every one of those. Other 26 students, young ministers. We had a couple that had come down from Dayton, Ohio, to Texas, to Fort Worth, Texas, to prepare themselves for the ministry. Name was Jim and Lois Hatcher. 
a precious couple. And they had a little boy, two and a half years of age, Greg. Now Greg was a mongoloid. His face was about twice normal size. Had no strength in his spine. He couldn't hold his, if you set him up and propped him up the right way, well he could, he could kind of sit there. But I mean, he had to be padded in. And, and, and the doctors told Jim and Lois said, Greg will never live to be more than three or four years of age. Maybe four, but no more. And they lived with that shadow in their life. And uh, Greg was a precious fellow. Lois and those, those were days back yonder, no air conditioning. Downtown Fort Worth, hot as blazes in the summertime. Not much wind downtown. You get out away from downtown, you might get some, but breeze and so forth. But there was a big old oak tree right outside the dormitory, and there was a park bench there. Lois, oftentimes in the hot of the heat of the summer and the afternoon, she'd go out there with Greg and, and set him up in a special little chair she had and prop him in, strap him in, prop him in. She'd sit down there right beside him and uh, on the bench. Maybe she'd sew or write letters or read or whatever she wanted to do. Students would come and go all the time, and when they did, they'd come in. They'd say, hi, Greg. How are you, Greg? Little Greg, he'd, his eyes would glisten and brighten up, and, and he'd begin to come excited. Sometimes he'd get so excited at attention, and he loved attention just like any boy would. And his head would fall over, and when it fell over, he couldn't lift it up. Somebody, and usually his mother, but whoever was there nearest, would prop him back up. Everything that was done for Greg, somebody else had to do it. Greg couldn't do a thing for himself. And one day, Lois went to the doctor. Doctor said, Mrs. Hatcher, you're going to have a baby. And Jim and Lois were excited, elated, thank, oh, we hope it's a boy. We're praying for a boy. And they were so excited about that. But you know, as the time began to draw near, fear began to come into their heart and doubt. What if Greg, the, I mean, what if the new boy the new baby, not a boy at this point, but this new baby would be an invalid and so forth. But being the Christians they were, they got on their knees and on their face before God. And they coveted together, not our will, but thy will. Lord, we're just your servants. Do with us as it seemeth good unto you. And they found peace, perfect peace for those last few days, weeks. One night past the midnight hour, there came a knock on my door. Being the uh, dorm parent, I had a car. The others didn't, most of them didn't, some of them didn't. And uh, there was Jim standing there all nervous and excited. He said, Brother Paul, it's time. Lois is about to have the baby. Will you take us to the Harris Hospital there in Fort Worth, just less than a half a mile away? I said, sure, Jim, be with you in just a moment. We got Lois in the car, drove over to the hospital, and we, they took her on into the delivery room and the preparation room, then the delivery room. Jim and I went into the waiting room and waited what seemed like an endless eternity for an hour or so anyway. And we waited, nervous, <laughs> excited. Well, that is an endless eternity. And we waited and waited, and finally the doctor came and said, Mr. Hatcher, you've got a fine little baby boy. Everything's all right, but. But what, doctor? What's wrong? Well, now, Mr. Hatcher, you've got to understand. What's wrong with my baby? Now, Mr. Hatcher, with modern science, with new techniques, and everything we can take care of, what's wrong with my baby? Well, Mr. Hatcher, he's born without this part of his face. He doesn't have a nose, but with cosmetic surgery, we can skin grafts. In time, we can build him a face. But it's going to take some getting used to until then. Well, they brought Lois into her room. She was still under the anesthetic. Jim standing there holding her hand, speaking her name softly. I was standing inside the door, heartbroken. What do you say to a couple like this now that had anticipated and so given themselves to the Lord? 
And finally, Lois began to open her eyes. She said, honey, what was it? God gave us a little boy. Is he all right? And Jim said, he's all right. She said, I want to see him. Jim said, honey, you've been through quite an ordeal. Please rest a while, and after a while, you can see him. I want to see my baby. She'd picked up something in his voice and his demeanor that, that, uh, that indicated something wasn't right. Mothers have an instinct like that. I don't understand. But anyway, she insisted. And the nurse said, I'll call the doctor and see if it's all right. He, she called the doctor. The doctor said, let her go ahead. She won't rest until she sees her baby. So the nurse went to get, get the little boy and bring him in there. And Jim, standing there with his wife, said, Honey, remember, we told God, not our will, but his will be done. And he tried to comfort his wife and prepare her for what was about to happen. Then the nurse came in there with the little baby in the receiving blanket, laid it there in, in Lois's arms. And Lois reached down and picked up the corner of the receiving black blanket and laid it back and looked for a long while down the strange little face of her precious baby boy. The hot tears flowing off her, out of her eyes, down her cheeks and off her chin. And finally she lifted her face toward heaven in her hand and said, thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving him to me. Somebody else might not have loved him, but you prepared me to love him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Folks, tonight that's the kind of yieldness God wants in your life and my life. A yieldness to say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jim and Lois yielded themselves perfectly to the Lord and found the strength and the grace for those next few years. I don't ordinarily tell it this way, but I want to share something with you because 15, 17 years later, they went back to Ohio and I'd lost touch with them. And I was in Dayton, Ohio. And guess who met me at the door? Jim and Lois. I said, look, I'm to preach in just a few moments. I'd just gotten off the plane, got there just before the service. And I, I, I want to see you after the service. I want to spend some time with you. So after the service, we talked with them, visited with them. And I said, I want to know about Greg. Well, Greg lived to be 10 years old. And he was a blessing every day of his life. He was special from God. And he was a blessing. I said, what about little Timmy? And Jim said, honey, you tell him. Jimmy was, I guess it was 18 years because he just graduated out of high school. And said, you tell him. And Lois began to tell with tears in her eyes. She said, you know, little Timmy, he's had 20 some different surgeries on his face. All through his teenage years, he had a patch over his face because the things they had to do. But said right now, his nose is a lot prettier than yours. <laughs> and then they went on to tell me that in the largest church in Dayton, Ohio, Gerald Fleming was pastor. Do you know him? He was there at that time run about 2,500 people. That boy, they told me, from the time he was 12 to the time he was 18, was the number one soul winner in that church. And he'd surrendered his life to the ministry. They had prayed for a preacher boy, and God gave him one, but they had to submit their will to his will. 
We don't understand why God does certain things in our life, but God does those special, not to hurt us, but to strengthen us and to fortify us and to make us strong. And what God's looking for today is not finished vessels. He's looking for that heart, that life, that'll be a soft clay in His hand that He might shape it and make it the vessel that He would be blessed to fill and to use for His glory. May I ask you, dear friend, are you willing to be that soft clay in the hand of him who is the potter that your life might bear fruit to his glory, that you might be a vessel unto honor? Our Father, we bow in your holy presence, so conscious of our own stubbornness and how oftentimes we get stiff and stubborn and and proud and arrogant and we get to thinking we're something when we're nothing lord help us to realize afresh that the one who will humble himself before you and let you work and lead and direct in his life is the one that you bless and use lord you're looking for soft clay tonight find it in each of our hearts and lives not a proud arrogant spirit not a stubborn will but oh god a yieldness not my will but thy will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.